Greetings my friends, this is Pastor Paul. I am glad you're able to join in and listen to this message which I have titled Worse Than Dogs. I have been thinking and deliberating and contemplating just like many of you have on the recent incidents that we have seen um, most notably the killing of George Floyd and I have been agonizing like many of you have over the meaning of human life. I was struck by the blatant nature of what I believe to be a killing. I was struck by the ways in which uh, people have talked about this and so I'd like to give my perspective. In fact I think this is God's perspective to the degree that I understand what God wants and what God is requiring of us and how God defines human dignity, I'd like to go there today. So if you don't mind traveling along with me, I'd appreciate this because I am truly baffled. I am baffled by how we have looked at this as a society and how long it has been since uh, people uh, with the skin color that I have, frankly, have been calling out for justice and yet we are met with injustice. This is not just a race thing because I think that we have really disregarded some of the fundamental aspects of what it means to be a society. A society that is kept together a society that is glued together by just common decency and a respect for human dignity. And so go with me on this journey today. I'd like to, before we get into that, uh, show you this video. Just watch it for a while, and then we'll get into it. Thank you. Today, another example of a white person weaponizing racism, and this one has an Australian postscript. Let me start by introducing you to New York citizen Christian Cooper, a keen bird watcher. You hear about birds, or you see them in the book, and you're like, oh, wow, that's an amazing bird. I'd love to see that someday. And then one day you're walking through the woods or uh, through a swamp or whatever, and suddenly flap, 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 flap. OK, so on Monday, Cooper, a Harvard graduate, was birdwatching in the Rambles, a woodland section of Central Park in New York City, where dogs are supposed to be on leashes. With a dog running around, he asked a, a woman, the dog's owner, to put her dog on its leash. She refused and, well, Cooper filmed the rest. Would you please stop? Sorry, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Please don't come close to me. Please don't come close to me. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm in the ramble. And there's a man, African-American, who's a bicycle helmet. He's recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African-American man, I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. <laughs> and my I'm sorry, I can't hear you that. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. I don't know. Thank you. So by the time the police turned up, they'd both gone, but Cooper posted the video on social media and it caused a stir. The woman, Amy Cooper, yes, they share a surname, no longer has her job. Her blatant attempts to use race and exaggerate the incident to turn the police onto this African-American man created a backlash. Her employer, investment firm Franklin Templeton, issued a statement saying they had terminated her employment. We do not tolerate racism of any kind, the firm said. Now, while this has been playing out, another much more horrific and tragic episode happened in Minneapolis. An African-American man died while being held down by police, 
even as bystanders, bystanders filmed the event and called on police to ease off. Now, this is hard to watch, but we need to show you some of it. Brother, your feet on his neck, man. You get out the His man. nose is bleeding. Like, yeah, come on now. That's wrong right there with his feet on his neck. Look at his man. nose. You see your knee on his neck. Yeah, he got your feet right on his neck. 46-year-old George Floyd died. Four officers have now been dismissed. An FBI investigation is underway. And there are passionate protests breaking out now in response to this horrible death. Black power salutes are being given and the volatility of the situation on the streets is obvious and understandable. The video here is central. Investigators will be able to see and hear exactly what transpired. Without it, it would be just word against word which is why this tweet from African-American comedian Roy Wood Jr. is pertinent. Black folk, he says, might be time to give a statue to the camera phone. It's done as much for fighting racism as Martin Luther King, Malcolm and Farrakhan combined. Yes, there's no disinfectant like sunshine, and the transparency of camera phones has brought many racist incidents to light. And so our thoughts and prayers are offered up for the families of those who have been victimized, those who have been killed, those who have been uh, uh, put under by hate. Hate from those who show no regard for human life and show no, hu uh, no regard for human dignity. I join with those of you who are outraged by the killings, and by the many killings of the past. We talked today about George Floyd, we remember him, but there are so many others. But we are baffled, like I said, we are truly baffled. So one, you know, we call for the, the, uh, the protest, and I call for protest in an intentional way. Not the kind of protest that is destructive, because... I would like us to look at and be mindful of how we protest because there is anger, there is real anger in communities and in our society. I would call for us to protest in a way that is mindful of not becoming like those whom we condemn, not becoming like the monsters that we despise. And so, as we pause for a bit, let's take this to God in prayer. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, we bow before you with humble hearts, seeking your strength during these very difficult times. Creator and Sustainer, may you allow us to see ourselves from your divine perspective May we appreciate your wonderful image in all human beings. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What does it mean to be a human person? I have been thinking about that more recently. And you see, it seems to me that it does depend on, first of all, who is asking the question, and secondly, who is responding to the question. As a Christian, I believe that a human person is created in the image of God, with all the rights and privileges afforded to every free being. Because we're made in the image of God, my friends, there is a divine spark, a divine instinct within us, within every person that allows, allows him or her to reflect the many attributes of God. This divine spark is what makes us different from the dogs or any other animals. For example, mentally, we are sentient beings that are capable of feeling. Rationally, we're beings that are capable of thought and thinking. Volitionally, we're able to 
make our own decisions. We have free wills. And in terms of intelligence, we're able to and we're capable of reflection and creativity. On the moral side of things, and in our original state, we are righteous people before God. We were. And we still retain enough of this aspect to be able to know right from wrong. We know right from wrong. And we know how to choose. And then there's the social aspect of this image of God planted in us. You see, as human persons, we're created for relationships. Relationships with God and relationships with our environment, relationship with each other, relationship with other living species. And that's essentially who we are. We're human beings created in the image of God, and we are in relationships, able to think, able to make decisions, able to know right from wrong, able to feel, and able to make the choices that we make on a daily basis. Now, I believe that that puts us a little above, if not far above, the dogs and other animals that we may domesticate. So this understanding of human person then begs the question, how do we value a human person? If a human person has within himself or herself a divine spark, the image of God. How do we then value? What is the worth of, for example, a homeless person? What, what is the worth of a poor person? What is, how much is a beggar worth? What is the worth of someone who is disabled? What is the worth of even a child molester? How do we value a Muslim? What is the worth of a Latino? And how do we value a black person? My friends, this is a conversation we need to have with ourselves and with each other. I do believe we're seeing the gradual disintegration of our society. I do believe we're seeing a gradual collapse of our society. And it is so gradual that obviously it is not seen easily, but it's there. Look at the blatant ways in which we conduct ourselves against the interest of our own common good. Look at how we treat each other. Look at how we, especially those of us who refuse to, to define human worth and dignity according to divine criteria. As a Christian, I do believe there is a set of standards that is present and that is clearly shown in the Holy Scriptures. How do we treat each other? How do we value each other? When our dogs or our pets mean more to us than any other human life, then it is just a matter of time before we as a society collapse. Whenever we elevate a dog or an animal above a person, any person, you take your pick, whichever person, whenever you elevate an animal above a human person, then we're doomed. We're on our way to be disintegrated. And this is not just hype. Obviously, this is what I believe, but if you study the history of how societies have worked, they have worked best when each person gives regard to the other person, no matter what the differences might be. And so we will, we will deteriorate into barbarism if we choose not to respect one person and if we choose not to, to then hold that person in high regard, even though we may not agree with them, 
And I know this is this is radical thinking. I know I know this is is going to call upon us to do some things and change some things in our lives. But think about it for a second, especially from the biblical perspective, which is what I'm trying to give to you today. Many of us have been guilty of treating others worse than dogs. And this has become so blatant in our society, even when the video cameras are rolling. It is so blatant, and we are troubled by it. Many of us are so troubled by it, we're numb. We do not know what to do, where to turn. And we seek justice. And hopefully, in the cases that we have seen, justice will be meted out. Now listen, listen to the psalmist, the scripture that we have chosen for today. The passage is in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Read with me. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful I know that full well. I know that full well. What is the context? The psalmist David asks us to recapture a divine perspective. Recall the divine perspective. And regardless of how we might feel about certain people, we are duty-bound and obligated, if we are in fact cognizant, of a divine presence, if in fact we believe that there is a God to whom we will be accountable. What we see and what we have been made to believe a lot of times have been distorted realities and distorted over the centuries by, by this war against humanity and war against human dignity, certain human dignity. And value, and therefore war against the image of God within us. So we want to play that game. We really want to play that game. We really want to go against the image of God in each person. That's not a smart idea as far as I'm concerned. Because now we see that everything we know to be decent and humane has come under attack. If we have not become worse than dogs, then a couple of things happen in our reflection. We're able to at least acknowledge two things. First of all, we are confirming God's creativity. We are confirming God's creativity. If we have not become like dogs, if we have not been made worse than dogs, we are confirming God's creativity. Because the dogs do not appreciate God's creativity. Psalm 139 and verse 13. Listen to this verse. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Confirming God's creativity, my friends, require, requires that we first define creativity. What is creativity? Creativity is responsible for every positive thing we see around us. Just look around you. We have the innate ability, this, this, this instinct about us, to produce and to build something or someone for the good of humanity. That's what creativity is. Creativity is the ability, obviously, to create. But a part of that creation obliges us to then work for the upbuilding or the uplifting of society and humanity around us. I guarantee you what we're seeing now in the killing of George Floyd, in the, in the false uh, 911 calls to the police, what we're seeing now is a disintegration of creativity. We're now scraping the bottom of the barrel. 
We're not utilizing our God-given imagination and those good thoughts and those good ideas, obviously for the common good. We're losing it. We're not confirming God's creativity. We're not affirming each other. No matter who that person is, that person has a spark of the divine within them. And therefore, they too have inherited this creativity. I pray God that we recognize that because we confirm God's creativity by living God's creativity. Let me say that again. We confirm God's creativity by living it. We live how creative we are. It is not creative. To have your knee on somebody's neck until they die. That's not an act of creativity. In fact, I would call it an act of cowardice. You have your knee on somebody's neck until the very life is drained out of them. This is not confirming God's creativity. It is being a coward. And it, it is hiding behind a badge, a shield. That is supposed to serve and protect the citizenry. And so we find ways to enhance our surrounding. When we confirm God's creativity, we find ways to make things better. What would it have taken if we just took a little while, find out what's going on, Mr. Floyd was obviously not resisting. We saw the video. And even when he was he was detained, he was he was he was immobilized on the ground, on the street pavement. What would it have taken for one of those police officers to call upon the divine image within themselves? so that they could also afford Mr. Floyd the opportunity to live. I tell you, we are deteriorating as a society. And the moment we do not find ways to enhance, that's when we know we have become worse than dogs. That's when we know that we've become worse than the other, the, the lower forms of life. God has given us, my friends, the ability to think, the ability to use reason, to express ourselves, and to construct. What would it have taken for one of those police officers to say, Hey man, ease up. He's not breathing well. What would it have taken at least four police officers, what would it have taken? That was not an act of creativity, it was an act of cowardice. When we put our collective knee on somebody's neck, with the full weight of our body and our authority to the point of snuffing out the person's life, then the dogs are way ahead of us in terms of moral standing. When we do this, when we engage in this, and when there's not universal outrage, and I hope there is, and I hope there will be, and I hope there will be justice served, but when we do that collectively as a society, we're worse than dogs. And this is no disrespect to the dogs. Because we're not capable you see, my friends, we're not capable of feeling and sensing that divine spark within us. When we weaponize 911 in such a way that we know that if the police were to arrive, someone who might not be a white person, but someone might be shot dead. Then we are beneath the dogs. Because dogs are not capable of such conscious and malicious immorality. 
We're beneath the dogs. We're worse than the dogs. I don't think we should celebrate this. Again, no disrespect to pet owners, but I don't think we should celebrate this. It means that now we are in chaos, literally chaos. So there, there, you know, there will be riots in the streets and protests, and there are going to be people who don't mean well, mingling and intermingling with legitimate protests and causing damage, causing violence. My friends, let's call it what it is. This is not just police brutality, it is police immorality. It is police committing sin against God Almighty while wearing a badge. It is not just white insecurity to call the police when you're threatened or feel threatened. It is not just white insecurity that allows you to pick up the phone and dial 911, hoping that the cops would come and then only God knows what's going to happen. It's not just police immorality. It is not just uh, white insecurity. It is overt hatred. Overt hatred. And you see, that's where, that's where we become corrupt. Because if we do not love, if we do not show love, then to heck with us. To hell with us. It is overt hatred that is being allowed to see the light of day. That's all it is. And as a society... Let us stand together to say, no, this should not be. We should not tolerate that. We are better than dogs. We are better than animals because we have that divine spark within us. So let us call it what it is. This is a full-blown betrayal of the public trust, a full-blown betrayal of our social contract. The pledge to serve and to protect should mean something. The use of 911 should be for emergencies only, not for our insecurities. And that woman in the park was choking the dog, but would never think of killing it. I found that kind of instructive. The black man on the street pavement, Mr. Floyd, was not that lucky. The dog received the better treatment. The dog in the park received the better treatment than Mr. Floyd. My friends, here's my second point. If we have not become worse than dogs then we're able to reflect the divine spark within us by celebrating God's creation. Celebrating God's creation. Not just confirming God's creativity, but celebrating God's creation. Verse 14 of Psalm 139 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Celebrating God's creation. We celebrate God's creative act in others. And we respect the image of God in every person, regardless of what we have been taught about them, or how we feel about them, or how we have been allowed to act toward them. We celebrate we celebrate the image of God in people. That's what we do as a society. That's what we do to prevent chaos. That's what we do to prevent disintegration. We celebrate the image of God within us. To celebrate is to acknowledge, isn't it? It is to acknowledge or to honor a significant person or a significant place or significant event or moment. You celebrate because there are people in our lives and there are events in our lives and there are moments in our lives that we want to remember. They are special. And so we celebrate. 
we celebrate God's creation. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Such a beautiful statement. So what do we have to celebrate? What should give us a sense of awe and wonder and God's creative work and image in us, of course? And it is a beautiful thing. He or she is a beautiful person. Next time as you're walking down the street, look around you, look at the people, look them in their faces and think for a while that this is God's special creation. This person is God's special creation. And I celebrate God's creation. It doesn't mean we won't have difficulties. It does not mean that we will not have disagreements. But what it does mean is that fundamentally we understand that people are who they are because of God. We are fearfully made. You know what that means? It means that we cause astonishment or we should cause astonishment and awe. We should be awed by God and astonished in reverence and, and in respect. Out of respect for God's creative act, we also respect God's creation. We celebrate. We celebrate a life. We celebrate a person regardless of who they are. It would be like a celebrity coming to your town or coming to your school. Or it would be like the president coming to your neighborhood. That's the kind of fearfully we're talking about. Awe, respect, honor. That's the sense of that term. And we have lost it, my friends. We have lost it. Every black person, every white person, every Latino, every Asian, every Native American, every gay, every Muslim, every Hindu, every person in our lives, every person we encounter has been endowed with that divine spark and therefore deserve to be respected and honored. Celebrating God's creation means that we're fearfully made. My feeling or your feeling about anyone does not and should not negate or take away from their essential dignity as human beings. Or else, or else, we ourselves become worse than dogs. We do not get to dictate who, who is to be honored and who is to be respected. That has already been determined. That has already been settled by God. As long as we are human beings, then we need to respect other human beings. We're fearfully made. We're made in awe and in respect. And if you, if you mess with the divine spark within somebody, you should be fearful of what a God is. Is capable of doing because God I believe protects God's own honor and God's own sense of respect and God's own sense of awe we should fear God and so the moment we we're tempted to take a life or the moment we're we're, we're tempted to put our foot or our knee on somebody's neck or somebody's chest or the moment we feel like picking up the phone and dial, dialing 911 because we're not comfortable or for some other mischievous uh, motive, maybe getting them killed. The moment we start thinking like that, fear God because God also has a say in all of this. So my friends, whenever we see someone being mistreated or someone who is being abused, <clears throat> someone who is setting up someone else to take a fall or to lose their lives, let us ask ourselves the pertinent question, don't they fear God? Because if you threaten the spark, the divine spark, if you threaten the image of God in someone else, then 
We need to fear God. We need to ask ourselves now, what's my end game? What is going to happen? And so we're fearfully made, but we're also wonderfully made. And to be wonderfully made is to be made in such a way, this is the sense of it, to be made in such a way that we're, we're, we're distinguished from others. There's a distinction among us. We make a distinction so that there's no confusion. Look at the uniqueness. Look at the, look at the ways in which each person brings to the table whatever he or she might have. That is the meaning of wonderfully made. We are set aside, we're different, and we should celebrate our differences. Celebrate how we have been endowed with divine gifts and talents and abilities. What would it have taken to try to recognize where each person is? What does it take? To try to, uh, to seek to find ways to enhance somebody's uniqueness. Wonderfully made means, think of the 4th of July fireworks. And all these, each piece of explosive that, that presents itself, presents itself in a unique way. You watch and see, you'll probably never see any two the same. That's what that means. Wonderfully made is that we still inspire awe. We still, uh, we, we still are shocked and ooh, ah, wow. We're shocked by how we're so distinct. How we're so, depending on your color or your noise or your smoke or your, or your floating material using the fireworks as the analogy. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Next time you observe fireworks, celebrate God's creativity in the human person, in the human spirit. Celebrate the divine spark within every one of us that, that manifests itself in so many different ways. Celebrate! This is the cause to wonder and to be at awe and to be excited. Not what we see on the streets in terms of the chaos caused by the killings and caused by malicious acts weaponizing 911. We belittle, not celebrate God's creativity when we allow these atrocities to be committed against human beings regardless of their race or their gender or their sexuality or their disability or their religious background, it doesn't matter. They have the divine spark in them and none of us has the right to take that away. All human beings are wonderfully made. Verse 14, the latter part says, your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My friends, as human beings, we have an obligation to act on what we know about the value of human life. The dignity of every human being should not be a guesswork or open for debate. A human being is a human being, is a human being. And that person has dignity innate dignity because of that divine image within each of us. Ignorance of this is no excuse. The psalmist says, I know this well. Ignorance is no excuse when it comes to divine judgment. Have you noticed, friends, when the racist is caught, they apologize? There's something to be said about people who do things that they know these things are wrong. But they keep doing them under the cover of something, some ideology, some agenda. And then when they are discovered, conscience takes over. And they realize and give some very lame apologies. Oh, 
I'm not like that really. Yes, you are. That's where your conscience kicked in. You know quite well. You know that other people have dignity, don't you? Even if you believe in your own race, even if you believe in your race pride, you still ought to believe that other people have dignity. And generally I believe that people are aware of their shadiness when it comes to racism. It's just that when it comes out in the public, and thank God for cell phones, and thank God for actually people, more people have cell phones now than ever. That when this comes to the public light, when it comes to public scrutiny, it is obviously more painful to these people, to the racist, to the hate mongers, than when they have it in their dark places. So light shed on a situation can be of much effect. So, let's return to where we started. Much of this has to do with disobedience toward God. But sooner or later, we will all need to answer in a divine court, in the court, the highest court, where God is going to be the presiding judge. And this is independent of whether or not you or I believe that there's a God. We can have those debates. But the possibility of having to sit before a God, a creator, is an awesome one. I don't know about you. In closing, my friends, I again, I join with you and all of you who are outraged by this, by the events in recent days and weeks, but I call on all of, all of us to be intentional. I, I call on you to protest with intentionality. And that means do not let this turn into, do not turn into the very monsters that you despise. If you need to write a letter, if you need to change laws, go out to vote in November. When we treat people worse than we treat our dogs, then we ourselves become worse than dogs. We're worse than dogs when we're not confirming God's creativity. And we're worse than dogs when we're not celebrating God's creation. Our thoughts and prayers go out to those who have been impacted negatively by all that has happened. We thank God for the possibility of life. We thank God for that divine spark within each person so that each of us can respect somebody else. You must now push, we must now push for legislation and hope that the political structure and the social structure that we serve and that which serves us will rise and understand and appreciate the image of God in people. My friends, thanks for watching and may God bless and keep you and your family. Until next time, God bless.